Erica Dagdon Minahan, and I'm here with my Rain Ventures co founder, Monique Idlet Mosley, every month to feature amazing entrepreneurs and investors that have built truly transformative businesses and are generous enough to share their stories with us. Now, you all know that venture capital has long been a closed system, and a lot of startup founders are unsure how or if venture can be a tool to help them grow their businesses. So as usual, we're going to be pulling back the curtain on early stage venture capital, introducing you to a top founder in the space and answering that very big question, what does it take to get to Series A? So we're thrilled to welcome Monique Rodriguez, founder and CEO of Myel Organics. Myel is distributed in hundreds of thousands of stores globally, including Target, CVS, Walmart, and Walgreens. Uh, Myel received national attention after raising a $100 million Series A from uh, private equity firm Berkshire Partners. So congratulations on that. And I know we're all really excited to hear how you did it. Um, and before we get started, we just want to remind everybody that we're really excited to take all of your questions at the end. So feel free to add any questions that you have for Monique to the chat or Q&A tab. And if you're in the chat today, please say hi and let us know where you're dialing in from. And, and I want to add something because not only is Monique an exceptional businesswoman, she's just as great or even greater of just a human being, just one of the kindest, most amazing, welcoming women that I've ever met in business. Um, just so thank you for being that on top of just a great businesswoman, but really yeah. leading by example on how we should all collaborate together. So we do appreciate that about you. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I, 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 I second that emotion. Ladies. I want to commend you ladies as well. And, you know, I've, I've told you this before, I'm super proud of you for even starting Rain Ventures. Um, there needs to be more women that look like us that are in the venture capital um, and in the, in, in the investment space. I'm leaving the way and leaving a mark in the industry. So I just want to commend you and say kudos to you as well. Um, Oh, thank you, Monique. We received that. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background and your career before starting Myel. Yeah, so my background um, was not the tra traditional business route. Um, for those that don't know, I worked as a registered nurse. Uh, so I did that for eight and a half years. I started out on labor and delivery in my last couple of years before starting my, I did home health. So definitely it was a learning curve because I did not come from the business space or the business background. It was on the job training and on the job experience that is teaching me what I know and I'm still learning to this day. Um, but I went to nursing school because growing up being from the South side of Chicago, my mom, we were a little bit over uh, low middle class, right? So we struggled growing up and she always instilled in me values of the traditional route of, su of success, right? Going to school, go to college, find a stable job and you work that stable job until it's time for you to retire and then you enjoy life. So for me growing up, I knew that there was much more to life than what my mom was teaching me. But however, not to take any credit away from my mom, that's all she knew. She came from survival and it was, I need to teach my daughter the best way to make sure that she can stand on her own two feet when she's out of my house. And so, you know, I well, even being a, you know, even becoming a nurse is actually a pretty big accomplishment. So, oh, yeah, you, you, know, accomplishment. you pick it up a notch, but that is actually <laughs> a pretty, a pretty great career path. <laughs> oh, it's a great, I mean, obviously we see how, how much nurses are needed, but it, it, it has to be a, a career path that you have to be truly passionate about. Like, I became a nurse because that was my mom's dream. It wasn't my dream that I wanted. Like when I was younger, I wanted to be a business owner. I wanted to be in the beauty space. Like I would, you know, tell my mom and, and ask her to take me to like model calls because I wanted to model for hair care companies. So that was always my dream. But I kind of was deterred because in her, her idea, her world was, that's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like, you know, how many people, you know, are running businesses or in the beauty space. So it was like for her, this is what is comfortable. And so 
it is a great career, but however, it wasn't something that I felt was fulfilling for me. I'm a very creative person, even though I love helping people and I love serving. That's what was fulfilling about becoming being a nurse. But I also wanted to be in control of my own destiny, my own schedule. I wanted to be present for my kids. And I wasn't able to do that working as a nurse. Like, if, and if we have any nurses on here, it's very taxing, like on your body, physically and mentally. And it just wasn't for me. And so, you know, I decided to take a leap of faith. It was after going through something very tragic, though, in 2013, I was pregnant with my third child, my son, and unfortunately, my son passed away due to the high-risk pregnancy. And as you can imagine, like my whole world was completely torn upside down and I was seeking purpose and I was very lost and in a very dark place. But what got me out of that place was number one, my faith in God. And number two, knowing that God has something bigger for me to do. And that was to make a big impact on the world in, in a major way. And so the vision came to me to start talking about hair and beauty on social media. So it kind of started as like a hobby because for me, that was a way to creatively express myself and to get my mind off of like what I was going through with my son. And I found an outlet in doing that. And the conversation started there with, hey, you guys, this is what I put on my hair today. I started making my own products at home in my kitchen sharing it on social media. And then people started requesting and asking to buy the products. And that's when I knew like, you know, I was on to something. I said, I'm gonna do my due diligence, start a website, find a chemist that can help me create what I was making at home. And then I launched on May 23rd and it just took off. And it was just- 23rd of what year? 2014. So we're actually coming up on our eight year anniversary. Amazing. And so- you know, it's just truly been a blessing and just confirmation that, you know, even though I went through what I went through and I would give anything to have my son here with me, um, it was a painful situation, a painful trial, but it led me to my purpose because even, you know, what you guys see front and center is hair care, right? But ultimately my purpose is kingdom building. I use my business and my platform to also your faith and, and, and believing in God because my life started to shift once I started putting him first. And, you know, I'm very vocal about that and, and sharing that. So it's bigger than hair care. Absolutely. And, and through your hair care company, you get to create this amazing um, community of women and men who just love, you know, um, it's interesting because in 2014 was definitely like this big, uh, can hair care products, right? You had um, Shea Moisture kind of trying to make some noise. You had Carol's daughter who had made all the noise with the celebrity investments, etc. And so what, what we can say was an oversaturated market, especially over the last couple of years, your company's been able to thrive. And I would really want to know, like, first, clearly your faith is what allowed you to not be fearful of an oversaturated market. But how did you like? How did you go into creating your own community to start taking some of that market away from others? Yeah, uh, because number one, I don't believe in a saturated market because I believe that each and every person on this planet has something to offer that someone else doesn't have to offer. Um, and I went into this business really having tunnel vision. Of course, I'm aware. I was aware of Shea Moisture. I was aware of Carol's Daughter. But being a consumer myself and doing my market research, I would go into the aisle and look at all the slew of products there, right? And I could have I got discouraged and said, okay, it's too many products. I'm not doing this. But I looked at the, the aisle and I said, what is it that these brands are not doing? They're not doing something authentic with what I saw is that there was a lack I felt that there was no one that connected with me there was a lack of education the products were very confusing on the market and 
there is also a lack of performance because I became a product junkie trying to find different products. The reason why I became a product junkie is because there was the things, there was not some of the things that I just mentioned, no education, no relatability. And the thing about this textured hair consumer is she needs to be educated. She has to understand her hair type, her hair texture, the porosity, the density of her hair, and then also the technique of how to use a product, right? And so that was a void that I can feel, that I felt I can feel. And I, that's how I started with education, with giving something of value that my competitors, so to speak, was not doing in this space. And being that relatable CEO where when I did launch a product, people would DM me, ask me questions on my comments, and I would answer them back. You know, there was not, there was none of that going on. So as a consumer, I couldn't contact uh, Richard Lou Dennis, who is the CEO of Shea Moisture, and ask how to use this product. And so that relatability and being authentic is what allowed people to really connect with me. And so that was my gift that I honed in on. And, you know, I just continue to be consistent, pushing that forward and doing it better than everyone else in the industry. So my advice for any other aspiring entrepreneurs is to really just evaluate your competitive landscape because there is something that they're not doing that that's a boy that you can feel and do it authentically. You know, on that note, organic I tell, you know, is a big part of what you guys focus on. You know, how did you decide that organic, not just in beauty, but in skincare would be, you know, sort of a pillar of this business? Before you answer that, Monique, to your last statement, we tell found lots every quarter with the way that, you know, the way that social media and technology and buying patterns and habits, they're changing so rapidly. And so I'm so glad you said that because you do have to constantly see where you need to pivot and what your competitive advantage is in your particular business model. So thank you for saying yeah. that. No, of course. It's very important. Um, and and as far as the question that you asked, Erica, so, you know, I really focus on natural and organic ingredients because being a nurse and seeing some of the things that I saw in the nursing field, our skin is the largest organ on our body. Everything that we put on our skin is absorbed in our bloodstream. And, you know, you have brands that will, so first of all, everything is a chemical. So I just want to put that out there. Water is a chemical. So there are chemicals in products. However, there are safer chemicals to use when you're formulating and um, uh, creating products. So I wanted to create products that perform well, and I didn't want to sacrifice, you know, the ingredients. I didn't want to use harmful preservatives and harmful chemicals. I wanted to use safer and effective ingredients and natural extracts and organic. Because I focus on hair health and scalp hair, scalp health. Because when you focus on the foundation, which is your scalp, that's when your hair flourishes and thrives. And so that's the approach that I took was just focusing on a natural and organic ingredient story to make sure that you know our consumers have the effectiveness of great ingredients, high quality ingredients, but also the high performance that our products uh, provide as well. You know that that I, I would wonder. You know, when you think about your community that you built, and you think about clearly kind of filling in that gap of communication, I find that as companies scale, especially the larger brands. Um, and they're global or national, that they literally forget and lose that community component. And I just feel like your company has done such a good job. Like, how do you look at that, keeping it no matter how large you're growing? Because you you've, grown, you've grown tremendously mm -hmm. and you're still growing. And how do you keep making each woman feel like you're talking only to them? Because that's literally what you've been able to do with your company. Yes, community is everything. And it's all in my philosophy of starting with the consumer first and ending with the consumer. And everything gets meshed in between. So we started, well, I started the conversation with talking with the consumer, like we're girlfriends having a conversation about hair care. And I maintain that authenticity by still being present. You know, I'm still very active on social media. I have trained my team on language and verbiage and, and the things that we post on our social media and our email blasts to make sure that the messaging is consistent and the conversation makes our consumers feel like, you know, we're the girl next door. 
so that secret sauce doesn't get lost. So I have trained my team to kind of mimic my voice because obviously I can't be everywhere at, at everything, right? Um, but it's really just training and developing and keeping our team members rooted in the foundation of how Maya was started. And we constantly remind our team of, we were founded in, in my garage in 2014. And this is how I interact with people on social media. And so, you know, just like you said, leading by example and being present, you know, helps our team understand that that community aspect doesn't get lost. And again, it's starting because the consumers are reason why we pride ourselves in always delivering excellence, taking our consumers on this journey with us. And I think with my leadership style and just having my team involved and them actually seeing it um, makes it that much more real for them to know, okay, we're not going to do this. Like they're going to think about the consumer before they put anything out, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love, I love that you trained your team and, you know, we all know that that's a huge lift for any consumer product company. I mean, I think what our audience might be really interested to know is, you know, what were your biggest learnings in going, you know, from zero in revenue to your first million dollars in revenue? Like what surprised you, you know, what can you share with them to help them on that journey from zero to one? Yeah. So zero to, to one I would say um, it wasn't smooth sailing. It was a lot easier from from going from zero to one versus once you got to that million, right? Um, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, once you get to that million, it's a bigger responsibility, right? You know, what I learned was to manage what's coming in and what's going out. Again, I told you I didn't come from business, definitely didn't come from finance and accounting, so understanding my P&L sheet, my balance sheet, my balance statements, and just understanding like the importance of having a good CFO and a good accountant that understood my business um, was something that I had to quickly learn because at one point in 2018, and I share this openly, um, we were $2 million in the hole because we had an accountant that came on board, did not understand our business, did not understand, you know, retail and trade spending because that's a whole nother component and it should funnel in under, under, I'm sorry, it should be a different line item outside of your marketing. However, everything was convoluted together. So we were spending, spending, spending so much in marketing, not monitoring our trade spend. And then we look up and we're $2 million in the hole because we spent all this money in pushing, you know, the, the retail and the trade spend, but we were not accurately monitoring it and Can calculating you let it. folks know what trade spend is? Everybody might not know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the dollars that we actually, that the, re, the retailers require of us to spend um, to grow our presence at shelf, right? So every time we do, like a, we did a lot of promotions with Sally's. We would do BOGO, buy one, get 50% off, um, buy one, uh, buy one, get one free. However, it may be free to the consumer, but we have to pay for that as a brand. So that is the, that's what's called trade spend. So any type of promotions that you do at the retailer, you know, the retailer is not going to take 50% off. You got to reimburse them for that 50% off that they're losing because they're not going to lose. And so that's what trade spend is. It's just really like the promotions that you do at show um, to increase your presence there. And we were spending lots of money and not tracking it. Um, and we ended up being in the hole um, very quickly. So that was, that was one of the biggest challenges. Manage your books, have a good CFO or an accountant that understands your business. Um, yeah, so I don't know what that was back there. <laughs> No, and that's important because, um, you know, you built your community first and then you went shelf. Some founders think it's better to be in these big retailers, but what they don't understand is that actually the retailer is not going to promote yep. you. It's not going to prioritize yep. you and it's definitely not going to, you know, bring in your, your already consumer. And if you don't have consumers then you're basically just sitting there. And so building that community first, especially in a startup, and then if you have a product and you're consumer driven, if it makes sense to go to shelf, then go to shelf, but absolutely understanding what type of partnership it is between you and that, and that retailer, because 
them putting you on the shelf does not mean that it's going to be beneficial to your company. And we, we have to pay really yeah. close attention to that because if we, especially as women and people of color are putting our, our consumer products on shelves and it's not a real partnership, then yep. they're checking that as if they tried it and it didn't work. Yeah, no, that, that is key of what you said. And I tell people this all the time because a lot of people, you know, they, they like to say, oh, you know, we're in partnership with Target because it looks good, right? right. But, but to support your brand at show and you have to come off of show, show where it has been very detrimental to businesses where they have gone bankrupt yep. because that shelf space that you are on, you're renting that space. Yep. You're paying for that shelf space. And it takes time and money and effort for right. them to have people go in and pull your products off the shelf. Who's got to pay for that? You have to pay for that as a brand. And that can be millions, thousands of dollars, depending on how many stores you have gone in. And so it's very important that you have that community and you have a loyal customer following that's going to support you at show. And also don't be afraid to start small. You know, you may go in to have these line review meetings and the retailer may say they may get really excited about your brand, even if you have a large following and they say, hey, we want to put you in a thousand stores. It is OK to say, no, we want to start in 40 stores. I, I started in Target in 50 doors, just 50 doors. That was it, because I wanted my you know, needs be an advocate for, you know, how I'm, how I should increase in stores, right? And then you can take that same information, others, you can take that information and now you have proof, you have your D to C numbers, you have, you know, your consumer surveys, the things that people are saying on social media, taking that to the retailers and saying, hey, look, the consumers want to see my yell increase. They want more doors. They can't find it at this target. They can't find it here. So now you have more of a, a stronger, uh, you given the retailer stronger conviction and say, okay, I can trust this brand and increase them versus, hey, I'm going to go on a thousand doors and I'm just waiting to see what happens just to say I'm in Target and relying on Target to promote your business is not going to work that way. Um, so don't be afraid to start small. And, and also that will show your retail partners that you're really serious about growing and partnering with them versus just leveraging and utilizing their platform, thinking that you can grow from there. Community is so important. Well, you know, this is a great example of why consumer products companies need capital, um, you know, in order yeah. to support being in these stores and it actually costs money to sell. And as you said, sometimes you can end up 2 million in the hole when you're sort of getting it off the ground. So, you know, this show is the series A list. So we got to cover this, you know. Tell us a little bit about when you realized that you needed to raise money um, and what the fundraising experience was like for you. Ooh, the and also the other addition to that question, I would be what, you know, you're so intentional, you know, speak about your intent as you strategized about your A too. Yeah. So it was definitely a process to get to A and, you know, I, I'm going to try to make this very concise, but when we were $2 million in the hole, that's when we were like, okay, we need some money. We need an investment, right? We were meeting with different investment, family and friend investment groups, right? Um, we were all the way to the finish line. We were meeting with this group for about six months and we felt that we really needed this investment to um, get us out of the hole because at that point I was like, I don't know if my company's, if it's going to like, are we going to continue to build or am I have to go, am I going to have to file bankrupt? Like I was like literally not sure, you know, the state of the business at that time. And so I really felt that we needed that investment. However, it was still a gut feeling in my spirit that they were not the right partners for me, but I kind of ignored that feeling because I felt 40% of my company for $2 million, right? And so fortunately for us, I always say God's, I mean, I'm sorry, man's rejection is God's protection because in I the flat, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to walk away, Yeah, but God provided that protection because they ended up pulling out of that investment deal because they said that our, our company was not financially sound and they were afraid to do it. But it was a protection for us because a couple of months later, 
we had a conversation with Richard Lou Dennis, who is the founder of Shea Moisture and also the founder of New Voices um, Investment. And so we were having conversations with them and they laughed at our problems. When I tell you they <laughs> laughed at our problems, they laughed. That's rich. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was like, no worries. We got this. We're going to invest in you guys, like just very nonchalant. And so at that point, I was like, okay, are they really going to invest in us? Because I didn't really know him at the time. But he followed through with his word. They looked at our books. They saw the potential in the company. They saw the growth trajectory. Because even though we were $2 million on the whole, our sales were like through the roof. Yeah. So it was like, you know, if we can just add a little fuel to their fire, this company is going to just, it's going to blow our minds. So they believed in us. And they did not want to take over majority of our company. So they gave us $5 million for 10% of our company, which is like amazing, right? And which, so which that, we should talk about that for a second because yeah. he literally was setting a tone of what the what your value of your company was. He's saying Absolutely. that we're only taking 10% at a $5 million investment, which then numerically increased your valuation tremendously, Absolutely. which kudos Absolutely. to Rich for, for doing that because that is what we need, especially in our women-led companies, is for someone to step in and give it the same value that men get in their businesses that aren't even doing as well. Yeah, you have a, an excellent point there. And, you know, that's why we also need more of us in this space. That's right. You know, that's having these conversations um, and giving us an opportunity and a chance. And, you know, Rich, I'm so thankful that he believed in us and he gave us a chance. Um, and so they invested. And obviously, right after they invested, COVID hit. <laughs> um, but fortunately for us, we were thankful because that $5 million got us out of that $2 million in a hole. Plus, we have more to really drive business and growth and market. Um, so that's exactly what we did when COVID first hit. I said, Rich, what do we do? Like, do we hold on to our money or do we put our foot on the gas? He told me to put my foot on the gas pedal, and that's exactly what I did. You did, baby. So. You did. And it was all things your company during COVID. Every everywhere I looked, it was your yeah. company. <laughs> yeah, like it was it was amazing. So I'm saying all that to say is our company saw tremendous growth, which made us even more attractive and our value more attractive to now have conversations with private equity firms. And I, I remember telling my husband, I said, I think it's time for us to raise more funds because my previous CFO that came along after the fact, when, you know, when I started finding a good CFO, um, <laughs> he told me, he said, the best time to raise money is when you don't need money. That's Our right. company was very profitable because it gives us more leverage, right? Our company was in a profitable position. We went from $2 million in the hole to being, our EBITDA was like, um, and they're like 30%, which was like wow. unbelievable to like banks, right? So I told my husband, I said, I think that we should raise funds because now I knew that as a CEO, I have the humility to say, I don't know everything, but I want to learn and I want to grow and I want to surround myself with smarter people, people that have been down this path and that can help me with the resources, the expertise and the access, right? Have doors open that I probably can't open myself. Um, so I knew that it was time for us to, to raise funds and I knew how much leverage we had garnered over COVID, right? And you know, you had companies that grew during COVID and then they went back to normal where our company continued to just thrive. And even still to this day, because we have great products and when you have great products, people are gonna come back, right? They may have tried us during COVID, but it's like, wow, this is a really good product. I'm going to keep purchasing. So our growth continued to exceed and, and, and scale. And so it became very attractive to private equity firms. So because of the investment with New Voices, you know, they helped us navigate, okay, is it time to raise again? And when we decided together, like it was time to raise again, they provided us with the resources, right? Yeah. So now we have, um, we were able to connect with, with our and the transaction, um, when they when we first met with them, they were blown away by our numbers because they had not seen a black company doing the numbers that we were doing with an even a margin that that we had you know, outside of like Shea Moisture, and even our numbers were better than than theirs. And so we went through this process of meeting with over 
40 different private equity firms and telling our story over and over again. They work with us to put the pitch, pitched all of that for us, obviously, you know, with our input, but they helped us tremendously with putting together what we needed to present to these private equity firms and also preparing us of what to even say. You know, we went through a whole pitching um, rehearsal of, you know, these are the things that you say to private equity firms. These are the things that you don't say. These are the questions that they will ask. So we felt very, very prepared going into these meetings and these pitch um, meetings with these private equity firms, but we were telling our story over and over and over again and finally narrowed it down to about um, six different firms. And we were very adamant and intentional about what we wanted. We said, we want someone to come in and help us. We don't want anyone to come in and take over our company. That's right. Someone to come in and, and try to take away the authenticity that our company has. We want to maintain majority ownership and we had a number that we would not take anything less than. And so it was their job as their as our banker to go find the perfect partners for us and match us with, okay, this is what they want. They want, you're, you're not having uh, no more than, you know, 30% of their company. Um, you're, you're not going to come in um, any type of control or, or they have a board seat, but they don't have controlling board seat, right? So we had laid out everything that we wanted because it was very important that, you know, I'm able to control my destiny with my company. And we narrowed it down and community was also, is also very important to us. And so whoever we partnered with, they had to understand the value of our community. And Berkshire, um, with, they met all the criteria. And not only that, but they invested into our community fund. They invested an additional $1 million to support our community efforts. Um, so, you know, again, long process, but that was from end of 20, uh, 2019 all the way up into 2021 is, you know, how we got to the Series A. So, again, I said I tried to concise it, but I just wanted to be like detailed to give you guys the yeah. backstory. And, and I love, I love the, you know, hundred million, such a great, like round number. How did you guys decide that's how much you wanted to raise? Um, because that was the value, like the company was so profitable, they valued, right. And so, you know, to take, um, 30% of our company, you know, I had literally wrote down what I wanted, right. Before I went through this process, you know, I'm like no less than a hundred million. And yeah. so, um, because the company company was so profitable, uh, that increased our value, you know, the brand and, and for the brand to be a great asset, there's no other brand in this space that was doing the things that we were doing. So it became a great valuable asset that everyone wanted to be a part of. Like we had private equity firms fighting over like, you know, having a conversation with us. And that's amazing. And that's why Melvin and I, we wanted to sit with 40 different firms. We didn't have to, but we wanted to share this story because what was important for us was for them to see black excellence, for them to see black people that have built something great and have built something so valuable and have built something so profitable um, in a very short time frame. Even when you were in debt, right? Because I think that, that even, yes. that's, that's yep. always been one of the big issues is that women and black and brown founders cannot yep. have any risk or liability um, we have to be so exceptional to even get a tiny percentage of the value yet traditional founders can like be have no real revenue and get these, you know, extremely high valuations. Um, and so yeah. that's yeah. a gift that you did for, for all coming behind you and around you, because yep. you did have to, you do have to showcase that mm -hmm. we run businesses the same way other people do for profit. And yes, we have obstacles and hiccups, you know, that happen along the way. Um, so there's one question from Sabrina B. She said, can you please expand on the average cost of shelf space in retail outlets? Um, you know, honestly, I can't just because with our retail partners, we can't share, okay. um, you know, what our costs are because everyone's cost is different and um, everyone negotiates different. So unfortunately, just because of our partnerships and contracts with the retailer, we can't share that. 
Yeah, well, and, and you know, I think I think that everybody's business, even if you could, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that relative. It was product is different. Every partnership is different. You know, all those things vary. Yeah. It would be more about you doing research and really, really having multiple options of partners and really digging deep into who is the best partner. Even if you're in a situation that requires some, that has some stress and some urgency, you still need to really, really like write out and map out what is the best yeah. partner, you know, for all of, all of this. You know, what's interesting, Monique, for me is personally is that, you know, we meet a lot of founders in the, in the very vulnerable stages. And um, when I started following you and getting to know your product line, you know, before it like got before the 2019, one of the things that I was originally attracted to was your ability to speak in an approachable way to your community. That really drew me in because no hair care line had ever talked to me in that way as a mm -hmm. consumer. Um, but then to get to know you personally in person and to see that on social media, you know, amazing, but you were even more exceptional. And so, you know, how important as a founder, no matter what obstacles, no matter what stage of the, of the earliest stages, you know, the real vulnerable, how important would you tell these founders in, in this audience that what it's, what you have to do to kind of be kind and, you know, how you have to, no matter what's happening, really, really care about how you're treating people internally and externally. Yeah. Um, I, okay. So I'm going to answer that, but I also want to back up to Sabrina's question. I just want to also add, um, finding a good sales broker in your industry will also help you understand and negotiate contracts. Um, because I had, I worked with a good sales broker, um, that was special that specialized in my industry that has seen numerous contracts. And so they, gave me a better understanding of like what's within the norm and what I should negotiate. So I just wanted to highlight that um, as well. But um, to answer your question, I actually just posted this yesterday. Like it's like, it really doesn't. And, you know, I've always operated where, you know, not necessarily treat people how I want to be treated um, because not everybody's going to treat me kind. Like just, treat people how God wants his humans on this earth to be treated, right? Because not every day I'm going to have a great day, but despite me not having a great day, that's not anyone else's fault, right? And I think that, um, so every, so first of all, every part of your journey leads you and it's helpful and educational tool to where you are today, right? And I'm saying that to say, yes, I worked at a, as a nurse. Um, does my nursing skill set applied to what I do today, some people will probably not think so uh, other than from a health and science approach, but the skill sets and the communication skills that I learned and being compassionate and being kind and, and garnering trust is something that I learned as a nurse. So before I went into a patient's room to stick them with an IV or to give them a medication, I had to, I wasn't going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, the same aspect of garnering that same trust and rapport with my consumers is, is really just developing a rapport and showing them the real me, like who you see on social media, that's who you're going to get in real life. It takes a lot more, a lot of more time and effort to try to portray that you're some way on social media and then be different, you know, in person. Like that takes too much work. Like if you're the same way and you're just authentic, and Jane, like that's less less effort for, for peaceful life <laughs> and the way that you do that is just by being the same and being nice and being genuine to people and not wanting anything in return but just truly treating people with respect um that's how I was raised that's my motto and you know I never feel that I'm above or better than anyone like because and I'll give you an example like I had a, a meeting with um, someone not too long ago, and it was a very, very important meeting. And I came across the same woman that I was meeting with, and I didn't know who she was. And when I met her, I shook her hand. I was very nice and respectful. And then when I got on the Zoom meeting and I saw her, I was like, oh my goodness, I just, like, we just met. And like, she didn't even say anything. Like, she knew that she was going to have a meeting with me, 
But I was like, you know, I was just thinking like, what if I was mean or rude to her, right? I could have lost an opportunity because of my attitude. Your attitude reflects your altitude. So always remember that and treat people kind and nice because you never know who you may run across or come in contact with. That's great advice. Um, I know we have a couple questions from the audience, uh, but before we dump, jump into those, uh, which we'll do in about three minutes, uh, I'd love to know, you know, what your outlook is for the next few years on the beauty market. Like what, what's in store for, for people who are, what are the trends? You know, what do you think the opportunities are for folks who are maybe thinking about building something? Yeah, so I think that the opportunities for the beauty space is really focusing on beauty as holistic wellness um, and not just an outward appearance, right? So I see that the, the trend and the focus is how do I make sure that I am internally together, mentally, spiritually, health-wise, because all of that is a reflection of how you look, how you, your radiance that you portray to other people, the energy that you give off, that's all how you take care of your body and tear and makeup in the world but if you are not told inside that's going to reflect and show on the outside so i think the way that the beauty trend is going is is really focusing on overall wellness and and being whole and for me just tapping into that um and that space with being a textured um, i'm sorry being a number one brand not only just for textured hair but being a lifestyle brand because it is holy, beauty is holistic. And so I want to be, and I will be the destination lifestyle brand for beauty as a whole, um, holistically. So that's, that's the direction I see beauty going and, and, you know, we're, we're on that same trajectory. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. That makes so much sense too, right? Because that is one component of it, right? You can be using all the right products, but, um, you know, if you're not eating the right food or you're not going to have the same results, you know, and so yeah. approaching it from a holistic perspective, in our opinion, has always been the better way to go. Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. We have about 10 minutes for audience questions. So I would highly recommend while you guys, while you guys have uh, Monique's ear and the opportunity to get her expertise that you populate the Q&A tab or the chat with your questions. Uh, so we'll start off with one from Calvin Harris. Calvin, always good to see you. He's a uh, longtime Series A list attendee and supporter. So Calvin wants to know, um, from the time you were $2 million in the hole and starting to think about funding uh, to the time you met your partner that gave you $5 million, I guess sort of, you know, what was the change there? Uh, you know, obviously Rich Dennis and New Voices. And then he says, until the moment that you actually achieved your hundred million dollar goal how much did you know you know sort of then versus I guess you did your raise in 2021 right so between whenever you were sort of realized you were in the hole and started thinking about funding to 2021 you know on a scale of zero to a hundred percent he wants to know how much sort of did your knowledge base increase <laughs> um so that's a great question <laughs> Um, so I would say from when we were in the hole to, to now, I would say my knowledge has increased just about the funding and investment arena. Um, I'm not 100%. I, I would say that. I would say I'm around like 50%. I'm still learning because a lot of the, the language, even now, like it's, it's foreign to me. Um, so I am still learning and growing, but I would say definitely a lot further than in my knowledge person. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, one of my question? favorite, yeah, it did, okay. it did. And you know, it's, it's so true, right? Cause you actually do kind of, I tell founders all the time, you want to always sit in that middle space. If we get to the place where we think we know everything, we're not learning yeah. and we we've, we've actually have cut our growth off. You know, so sitting in that middle place of understanding that the evolution of self is like never ending. Um, and, you know, because I have this favorite quote that Maya Angelou did, and it's like, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. And so as you continue to grow your business, um, you're always going to sit in that 
in that growth period because that's the whole point, right? That's actually the whole point. So our next question is from Sabrina B. She said, can you please expand on how you found your sales broker? Yeah, so um, so I found, so it's a funny story of how I found my sales broker. So my um, we were selling in mom and pop beauty supply stores before um, you know selling to big box retailers. So the one of the store owners, she was a black owned beauty supply, and she called me and she was like, "Your products are flying off the shelf. I can introduce you to um, the sales broker. She can get you into like Target, Sally's, and CVS." And so I kind of blew her off. I was like, okay, how many people have told me they can give me in salaries to Target, whatever. So I kind of ignored her. Um, <laughs> so she followed up two more times. Second time, I still kind of was like, okay, well, introduce us, make the connection. Um, but the third time, my husband was on the call with us and he was like, we're going to call this lady. Like, you know, because I was also, you know, when we talk about evolution and, and what I've learned, I was also a, a very, um, I won't say very, but more timid and reserved. So, you know, didn't want to like bug people or, you know, really meet people that I didn't know. <laughs> right. But that's important for business. Uh, and so we got on a call with her and she immediately was sold on the brand. We told her our story. She flew out to Chicago, met with us. We showed her some D to C analytics and stats. And she was like, you know, I'm going to work with you guys. So I guess my story is a little untraditional of how I met my broker, but brokers are at trade shows. They are, you know, if you go to like B2B trade shows for, for me in my industry is Cosmoprof, you know, going to like the hair shows for my industry is Real Natural Hair Show, Essence Fest. These people are lurking around. The buyers at Target, Salads and CVS are even lurking around these shows as well. Um, and again, that's why I say always treat people with respect because a buyer can literally come up to your table and you not know who she is. Um, and she's interested in your brand and you don't want to turn her away because of your attitude. So, um, these people are always out there, um, at these shows. And I feel like shows and B2B trade events are the best places to meet brokers and buyers. That's great. Um, wonderful. All right. So we have another question from Pian Pian. I think I pronounced that properly. Um, what level of revenue did you need to get to, do you think, before you went out to raise capital? Like how much annual revenue does, does a company in, in your space need to generate before investors start getting interested? Yeah. So I think it depends on the, the, the firm that you're raising um, money with and, and, you know, you can easily look on their website to see what type of companies they invest in. Um, so like Berkshire, you know, they have it clear on their website. They don't invest, they don't make an investment smaller than a hundred million dollars, right? And I think they also have like revenue, revenues on there. So for us, there our revenue had to be between, I believe 20 and, you know, above 20 million um, to have a conversation with them. So you really just have to look at the investment firms that you're looking to partner with and see um, and see like where the revenue needs to be before you engage and have conversations. It's, it's public information, it's listed there. Yeah. No, I, I think she probably, an, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, that's such an important point, right? Is that founders get really, um, they get really hard on themselves because they hear no a lot, right? When they're fundraising mm -hmm. and they're trying to, you know, get to that series A, et cetera. And what I've told them and what Erica tells them is that the same way investors are doing due diligence, it's your obligation to do due diligence on the investors because mm -hmm. you may be hearing no's from people you shouldn't even be going into meetings with, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to actually increase your, increase the opportunity of investment by speaking to the firms that actually do exactly what you are looking for and that you're meeting their requirements as well. And so um, thank you for talking about that because a lot of people don't know that they're supposed to research the investment funds too. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of doing due diligence on these firms, uh, Duran asks, when you raised money from New Voices Fund and they worked with you to coach you on your pitch to private equity, what were your most important learnings from them? From what was my most important learnings from New Voices? Like, or yeah, from New Voices. Like when they were getting you ready to pitch the private equity companies, he, he specifically asked, what did, what did they help you that you thought was really, help you with it, you thought was genius? Um, 
Let me see. It was a couple of things. So I would say they really helped with crafting the story and the messaging because stories sell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being a company that also stands for something and not just being a company that extracts dollars from the consumer, you know, having purpose. Um, And, you know, we are like we have purpose, but really articulating and refining what being purpose and mission driven means um, was something that, you know, we had to really craft and hone in on how to articulate that to investors because, you know, the investors know, especially when they're giving large sums of money like that, they want to know that you as a founder, yeah, you maintain majority ownership, but are you going to go fly off in the sunset and, and get on yachts and forget about the business because they've given you all this money? Like, what, what does that mean for them? So that can be a scary aspect uh, for these firms to make sure that, you know, you're going to stay on board. So being able to reassure them and, and garner that trust with them that, you know, you're not money driven, but your purpose and mission driven uh, was a, a big key learning for me because that's what they like to, to, to hear and see. Right. Um, and then I also learned that, again, I'm going to have to go back to knowing that it's OK to not know everything um, and being humble enough to tell your potential partners that, you know, this is a partnership we want to learn from each other. And more importantly, I want to learn uh, from you guys. I want to tap into your resources, your network, and, you know, be a student to help grow and scale the company because investors, they're looking for growth. They're looking, you know, what does the future look like? And they also are looking to see if they can work with you. I mean, you should be looking at the same thing. Obviously, that's a part of your due diligence, but, you know, having a, a humble spirit allows them to say, you know what, we can probably work with this person Um, And it makes it that much easier for them to believe in you because you're telling them a great story. You have a humble spirit um, and you are able to articulate, you know, what the future looks like for investors that captures their attention. And um, and then um, another lesson that I learned is, you know, after the the story and the the, the picture of how you're going to articulate their numbers people so they're all about you know what does the future look like how do you put projections together because they want to be able to see like a return on their investment um and so putting like together five-year forecast was something that you know was totally foreign to me and it was like okay whoa we're going to do this in year five but again they're numbers people so being able to tell a story with the numbers was also something that was very key and important um that i didn't know going into this yeah, that's that's you learn. We learn so much every day, right? As we're going through this, yeah. <laughs> we we tell um, our founders and our partners all the time. Thank God we have complementary skill sets. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't want to own a firm where my my business partners. That would mean that we're leaving something off the table. Mm-hmm. And so it is. You're it, you're you're so right when you said that. I think we have time for one last question. Um, let's see. Rhea J said. Uh, How many people are on your current team and did you hire friends and relatives um, in your more humble stages, I'm assuming? (laughs) Um, So we have about, um, we're up to about 90 employees and we're still hiring. Like we are currently hiring, you know, at this moment. Um, In regards to the friends and family question of if I hired, um, my mom helped in the initial beginning. friends and relatives, I'm sorry. Uh, my mom helped in the initial beginning when we were in our in our basement and garage shipping out orders. Um, and honestly, after that, I did not hire any more friends and relatives, but that's just because my friends, my family and relatives, you know, you have to know who you're dealing with. Right. And, you know, <laughs> not everyone in my family like understand business and you know, what it takes to operate. We did have an incident where we did hire just for help. And when we got to the point where it was time to scale and move into a warehouse, just for instance, we changed our, we had to go to payroll. We could not no longer pay people under the table and and give them cash because we have to pay taxes. We'll get in trouble for that. And, you know, you have family that's like, well, I can't do that because I have section eight. 
And so, well, you can't work for the company then. So, you know, and, and I value relationships and I feel that if it's going to be something that will damage a relationship, I just rather not go into business and work with anyone because I, I, I would like to maintain the relationship first. And if I know who I'm dealing with, and I know this person won't have any concept or understanding of how to run and operate a business, if I have to make a hard decision and have to fire someone, like they're not going to understand that and get it. And it may cause a strain on our, our relationship. I value the relationship first. And I know I can swear, but that's just my family. Everybody's family is different. So you really have to just know what you're working with. Yeah. I, you know, I personally believe in training up and, you know, like, so for example, Erica and I have two sons who are very entrepreneurial, like, but they already are naturally that. Yeah. So one of our things, you know, when we think of like longevity for our company and, and what the history that we've been able to do and create with Rain Ventures, because we do have two um, sons who are operators and entrepreneurs and actually want to understand this. Right. You know, we incorporate them into our learning model so that they can be kind of, you know, in case of an emergency, they understand what Rain Ventures is. And so you're right, it, it's case by case. And it's exactly, also yeah. it's not, you know, we don't have an obligation to hire anybody in our family. That's not, you know, that's actually not enough of a reason. What, what could potentially be a reason is if that family member or rel- friend or whatever actually is qualified. So yeah. you can't leave that off. You cannot leave that off the table. Someone still has to be qualified for the role you need them to play in a paid position. That is a very yeah. serious thing, especially when you're scaling a business model. Yeah. And you're you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, for instance, Richard Lou Dennis, Shay Morsha, they were family owned and operated. But to your point, he had people that were qualified for those positions. Right. But he did he did admit that he had to let go of some family and they understood. Yep. at that time because of you know whatever reason or qualifications so that's why I say it's literally case by case my I don't come from a family like that you know I am the first generation entrepreneur you know first generation um like I'm literally changing my family's trajectory right so not a lot of my family are even college educated which is you know nothing wrong with that but you know just, just for me and my experience it does not work for me but I have seen plenty of families that do it and do it well and efficiently. So you really just have to, like you said, know the qualifications and if that person is able and qualified to do the job. Because that's what it really depends um, depends on. Yeah. Sorry. One thing I will say on that is, you know, and to the person who's asking, I forget who it was, Gia, perhaps. The yeah, one really. issue is that if, you know, you end up in Monique's position where you're going to private equity and you're saying, I want to run, you know, raise a hundred million for this business. And then they look and they realize that all the employees are your relatives. That will actually be a huge red flag for fundraising going forward. So, you know, it clearly wasn't something, you know, that you thought of as an option, but, you know, to this person, um, that can be a red flag, you know, when, when it comes to taking it out of a family owned business into a business with outside institutional backers. So anyway, wow, that hour just flew by and, uh, yes. <laughs> Monique, we want to thank you so much for sharing your priceless experience and feedback with our community. And we want to thank everyone who joined us in live or who's watching the recording on YouTube. We hope that you'll all join us next month. And if you're a founder looking to raise capital, please contact us and submit your pitch at rainvc.com. Thanks so much, everyone. We hope you have an awesome week.